As I grip my ticket and stare up at the outside of the Atlantean Tribute, I start to realize just how much I've needed this vacation. It's been, what, almost four years since I took some time for myself? Maybe five? The past few years all kind of blend together. To say that things in my professional life have been hectic is a massive understatement. When I first took the job, I had thought that moving to a smaller media company in a smaller market would mean that I would have more free time than I'd had back in Chicago. That turned out to be completely wrong, as I had quickly found myself having to handle multiple roles simultaneously. I was and still am up for that challenge, but there's no question that I need to recharge my batteries. I'm just so damn weary. I have to remember to thank my assistant when I get back to Wyoming. When I had been racking my brain for a place to take my well-deserved vacation, she had been the one to suggest a cruise. She had pointed out that it would take me completely away from work, and outside of a couple of stops I wouldn't even be able to be reached by cell phone. I nod up at the ship. Being completely disconnected sounds just like what the doctor ordered. The smile slips a bit. Quite literally ordered, actually. My stress and blood pressure levels were partially responsible for me taking a vacation at all. They weren't at dangerous levels, not yet anyway, but they were certainly on the right track. I need to kick back and relax, making sure that work is the last thing on my mind. Maybe that will also help with the dreams. I almost didn't make it here in time. My connecting flight in Georgia was delayed, which in turn made me late getting into Florida. Luckily, the cab driver I'd managed to find didn't seem to pay much attention to things such as posted speed limits, and he got me to the dock in what had to be record time. Sure, it had meant that my life had flashed before my eyes a few dozen times during the ride, but I can't argue with the results. I hand my ticket over to a smiling man in a small booth, and he waves me towards a large x-ray machine. I give my bags, a duffel bag with my clothes and a leather case my laptop, over to a security guard to check while I pass through the machine. Everyone involved is extremely pleasant, and I can't help but note the difference between this and the miserable checkpoints I had gone through at the various airports. Once the guards are convinced that I'm not carrying a thermonuclear warhead, I join the line of people walking up the ramp leading into the ship. I'm strangely pleased to see that I'm not the only one that looks like he needs a vacation. There are a few people in the line that appear to be in even more desperate need of one than I am. Now that I'm closer, the Atlantean Tribute is even more impressive. At nearly 1,100 feet long, its 16 decks rise high above me and cast a long shadow over the dock. In pictures and even from a distance, the ship had looked pleasant and inviting. Staring up at it from this close, however, feels a bit intimidating. I reach the top of the ramp and head inside. Blinking to help my eyes adjust to the dimmer light, I take a look around and have to admit that I'm impressed. Everything is decorated in an almost Victorian style. The walls and floor are adorned with dark wood, and gold-colored chandeliers hang from the ceiling. Plush ornate sitting room furniture is off to one side, and at the end of the long carpet I'm standing on is a reception desk. Behind the counter is a beautiful woman with the reddest hair that I've ever seen. It hangs over her shoulders, framing her pale, freckled face. She's wearing an expensive-looking all-black suit. She smiles at me as I approach the desk. The registration process is fairly painless. I'm given a key card to the cabin that I've reserved, and the woman hands me a brochure that discusses all the perks that I receive at the level of travel package that I purchased. While I didn't go at the highest level, as the pricing for that was astronomical, I didn't skimp out on my package either. It takes me a minute to fish out the medical documents that the cruise line requires at check-in. Since we'll be traveling to a number of areas with little to no cell reception, records are needed for the ship's medical staff in the event of an emergency. I eventually manage to produce the slightly crumpled documentation, and the woman takes them from me and places them into a locked drawer so that they can be transported to the medical office later. I'm finally past all of the setup process, and I find myself free to roam around my home for the next two weeks. My first stop is my cabin. There's no point in carrying my luggage around, after all. And besides, I'm still dressed in my colder climate clothes and I'm starting to sweat. Near the reception area is an elevator, and I take it to the sixth deck where my room is located. Even the elevator and the hallways are done in the same Victorian decor. I'm not much of an architecture guy, 
but even I have to admit that the inside of the ship is quite amazing. It was obviously designed by someone with taste. My cabin is cozy, but not small. I unpack my bags and get changed into khaki shorts, a short sleeve shirt, and leather sandals. Once I'm finished dressing, I push open the curtains and look out the window. I'm on the side of the ship facing away from the dock, so all that I see is the clear sky and blue water. Now that all the prep work is done, I'm not sure what to do with myself. What does one actually do on a vacation? It's been so long that it's hard to remember. The answer comes to me quickly. After hours of flights and cab rides, the obvious place to start is with a stiff drink. Taking out the pamphlet that I was given at the reception desk, I open it up and examine the map of the ship that's on one side. I'm amused but not too surprised to find that there are quite a few bars and lounges on board. There's actually one nearby on the same deck as my cabin. Taking one last look around the room to make sure that I'm not forgetting anything, I begin to return to the hallway. My hand is on the door handle when I feel a heaviness in the air. I hear the shuffling of feet behind me and the whispering of a voice in my ear. I close my eyes. I should have expected this. People die on cruise ships more often than most people think. I close my eyes and take a deep breath. This is fine, I tell myself. It doesn't feel like it's specifically focused on my cabin. More than likely it's just generalized on the ship itself. I open my eyes again and continue into the hallway. I'm not a heavy drinker. It's not because I have a history with alcohol or some moral objection to it. I don't drink much because I'm not a fan of how most alcoholic beverages taste, and I prefer to drink for taste. Every so often, though, there's a moment that calls for something harder than a soft drink or coffee. When those times rear their ugly heads, I tend to go with the White Russian as my beverage choice. What can I say? I saw the big Lebowski years ago, and the dude, the dude still abides. The bartender keeps up a friendly banter as he expertly prepares my drink. When he's finished, he places a napkin on the bar before carefully setting the glass on top of it. He then asks if I want to drink it there, or take it with me to the observation deck to watch the ship set sail. I'm not sure why, but I hadn't even considered that. I tip the bartender and make my way up to the deck that he indicated. There are well over a hundred people there when I arrive, but there's still plenty of room for me to find a spot at the railing. I barely swallow the first sip of my drink when the ship's horn sounds and the vessel begins to move. Down below on the dock, people are waving up at family and loved ones on board. There's no one down there wishing me well, of course, but it's still an oddly moving sight. I'm reminded of old film reels depicting soldiers being shipped off to war. I spend the rest of the day slowly exploring the cruise liner. I know that at some point I'm going to have to actually start enjoying my vacation, but I want to get a sense of my surroundings before doing that. Well, not so much want to as need to. I'll readily admit that I'm not the type of person that finds it easy to relax, especially in a new location or situation. I find myself on one of the observation decks as the sun is setting over the ocean. It's truly magnificent. I've obviously seen the sunset before, but there's something different about it out on the water. It's like it's sinking below the waves and off the edge of the earth. I stare out at the horizon until the last of the deep purple is gone from the sky and the stars begin to come out. After eating dinner in a seafood restaurant, I decide to head to bed early. That might seem like a strange way to start a vacation, but in my line of work, getting a long, uninterrupted sleep is the ultimate luxury. Just the thought of it makes me smile. I go back to my cabin and get ready for bed. It's a bit warm in the room, so I turn on the air conditioner underneath the window. Or rather, I try to. I turn on the knob and I try to adjust the settings, but nothing happens. I frown. It probably says something about my personality that I somehow expected something to go wrong. There's no way that I'll ever be mistaken as a handyman. My understanding of machines, even basic ones, is rudimentary, and that's really being kind. Knowing this, I still lean forward to take a closer look at the air conditioner. I can't fix it. I'm very much aware that I can't do anything to make it run like it's supposed to. 
yet here I am, leaning forward and examining it anyway. I notice a small object sticking out of the side of the small control panel. Curious, I reach out and pull it free. It's a small piece of folded paper. Not really sure what to think, I unfold it and find that there's writing inside. They only come if the air is on. I turn the paper over, but there's nothing written on the other side. I read it a second time to make sure that I understand it correctly, and then a third time. For some reason, I just can't wrap my head around it. It's such a random statement on such a random piece of paper. There's a knock at the door. I'm so focused on the note that the sudden noise makes me jump. I close my eyes and allow my heart rate to return to normal before going over to the door and opening it. On the other side is a member of the ship's staff. He's a large man dressed in a white shirt and pants. He's holding a large black case in his right hand. He smiles at me pleasantly and tells me that he's here to fix my room's air conditioner. Under normal circumstances, I wouldn't have found that strange. There could have easily been a work order put in for repairing the unit before I had been assigned the room, and those repairs could have simply been delayed until after the ship set sail for any number of reasons. Because of the presence of the note, however, I'm immediately suspicious of the timing of this man's arrival. Besides, there's something... off about him. I can't describe it better than that. Years of being a reporter has developed whatever mental muscle controls my bullshit detector. There's something in the man's demeanor, or maybe in his expression on his face, that makes me think that this appearance doesn't have anything to do with ensuring that I have a nice cool breeze while I sleep. Still, I don't know that anything is wrong for sure, and even if there is, I don't know what that something is. I smile at the man and step out of the way so that he can enter the cabin. The man comes in and informs me that, due to company policy, I'll need to leave the cabin while he works. Making sure to keep an innocent expression on my face, I tell him that's not a problem before almost absently asking him why that policy is in place. He explains that it is for a number of reasons, such as possible dust that needs to be cleaned out and just in case there's a leak that needs plugged. Those are valid reasons, of course. The way he gives them to me only increases my level of wariness, though. Again, I can't quite put my finger on why that is. I decide that the best course of action is to just go along with things instead of questioning the repairman further. With a smile, I tell him that I'll leave him to his work and collect my keycard and lanyard before opening the door and stepping out into the hallway. Just before the door closes entirely, I stick out the tip of my foot and stop it from latching. I look up and down the hallway to make sure that it's empty before silently counting to 20 and pushing it back open enough to see the cabin with one eye. The man has his case open, and as I watch he extracts a number of perfectly normal tools out of it. Once he has laid them out, he uses a screwdriver to remove the front of the air conditioning unit and peers inside. I begin to doubt myself. Nothing about what I'm seeing is out of the ordinary. With a shake of his head, he reaches back into the case and takes out a rectangular black box and places it gently onto the carpeted floor. He then extracts a gas mask from the case and puts it on, tightening the straps to make sure that it's airtight. Well, now that that is certainly out of the ordinary. I can't see what he takes out of the box. His body blocks it as he lifts it out and does something with it inside the air conditioner. When he finishes, he closes the box without putting anything back into it. Whatever it is, it's still inside the unit. The man seems to be finishing up his task now. Closing the door as quietly as I can, I hurry down the hallway and into an alcove containing vending machines and a silver ice machine. I listen intently until I hear footsteps approaching. Taking my wallet out of my pocket, I slide out a credit card and swipe it through the reader on one of the machines before pressing a button for a soda. The can drops out through the slot a moment before the repairman passes by the alcove. He notices me retrieving the soda and informs me with a smile that the repair is all finished. Telling me to have a good night, he continues on. I count to twenty before heading back to my room. I hesitate with the keycard in my hand. Maybe I'm being ridiculous. Like I reflected a bit earlier that evening, I know basically nothing about repairing appliances and home equipment. Maybe what I had witnessed was perfectly normal. 
There's only one way to find out. I open the door and go into the cabin. Making sure the door is locked behind me and the chain is latched, I slowly approach the air conditioner. I feel more and more apprehensive as I get closer. Closing my eyes for a moment, I force myself to calm down. It's a damn air conditioner. Whatever's going on, I don't have to treat it like it's a live cobra. I kneel down next to the machine and look it over. I'll need to remove the front panel, but it's not like I have a set of tools on me. I locate the silver screws and smile. Luckily, they're flathead screws. I learned a trick a long time ago from my father. Opening the soda can, I break off the tab and slowly push it into the gap on the first screw. My luck continues to hold, as it's just about a perfect fit. A bit larger or smaller, and this wouldn't work. Being careful not to put too much pressure on the tab, I slowly turn it. The screw rotates with it, and within seconds I've got it removed. I move on to the others and have the panel unscrewed in under a minute. I remove the panel and stare into the unit. It's not hard to find what the repairman had placed inside. There's a plastic cylinder attached to some wiring and a tubing. It's not transparent, but it's thin enough that I can see some of the fluid inside. I use my very limited mechanical knowledge to try to piece together what I'm looking at. The cylinder connects into the bottom of the unit's fan, and there's what looks like a small tube or nozzle that comes out of the top center of that fan. From what I can tell, the liquid is injected through the nozzle, and the spinning blades pump it out into the cabin. There's something else attached to the bottom of the cylinder. I have to almost lay down on the floor to get a good look at it. This I'm more familiar with. It's a wireless transmitter. I sit back up and stare at the inside of the air conditioner. So when the unit is turned on, the liquid is dispersed into the room. The transmitter then, what, notifies someone that it's been activated? I remember the words on the note. They only come if the air is on. Something is very, very wrong here. The smart thing to do is to get as far away from here as I can. I'm already reaching for my bags and I remember that I'm on a cruise ship in the ocean. There's nowhere for me to go. Not yet, anyway. According to the itinerary, the ship will be docking at the first of the islands tomorrow. I can get off there and hire a boat or a plane to get me back to the States. A quiet thump makes me jump. It came from the other side of the wall to my right. After a moment's hesitation, I go over to it and place my ear up against it. There are some muted sounds I can barely make out, but they're too distorted for me to place. I suddenly realize that I'm least safe when I'm in my cabin. It's a small private space, and me not turning on the air conditioner when it's this warm and the unit was just serviced might raise some red flags with whoever is monitoring. Luckily, the cruise ship offers a wide variety of activities around the clock. As much as I don't feel like participating in fun and games at the moment, it gives anyone that might be keeping track of me an excuse as to why I'm not in my room. Being careful not to disturb anything inside the unit, I put the front cover back on the air conditioner and return the screws to their places. Once I'm finished, I take a moment to compose myself before leaving the cabin. As I pass the room next to mine, I hear more of the thumping noise coming from behind the door. I hesitate. This could be an opportunity to get more information about what's happening, and the more I know, the greater are the odds that this is something I can get through unscathed. On the other hand, I might just be hearing the audio results of a particularly vigorous sexual encounter. I hear the ding of the nearby elevator arriving a bit further down the hall. That same internal voice that had served me so well a bit earlier with the repairman is now telling me that I need to hide. I return to the alcove with the vending machines and wait. After a few moments, the red-haired woman that checked me in when I first arrived on the ship walks by. She's pushing a black cart with a black sheet covering it. I wait until she's past the alcove before leaning out into the hallway to watch her. She arrives at the cabin next to mine and produces a key card from inside her suit coat. Swiping it, she opens the door and pushes the cart inside before closing it behind her. There's nothing to do but wait. I try to look as inconspicuous as possible in case someone else enters the corridor, but no one does. I feel extremely exposed. 
I'm just about to give up my vigil when the door opens again and the woman pushes the cart back out into the hallway. The edge of the sheet catches in the door as it swings shut. It pulls away from the bottom of the cart, and the woman has to stop to pull it free and readjust it. Before she can get it back into place, I see the clear plastic bags containing blood neatly arranged on a silver shelf. The red-haired woman finishes adjusting the sheet and comes towards my hiding spot. I duck back into the alcove and press myself up against the widest side of the doorway wall. A few moments later, I hear her go past me and back towards the elevator. I continue to be as quiet as possible until I hear the elevator chime as the car arrives. I count to ten before going back into the now empty hallway and hurrying towards the elevator. This isn't because of some plan that I had come up with. Truth be told, I didn't know what I was going to do until I started to. It's those reporter instincts kicking in again. I stop in front of the elevator and watch the floor indicator above it. I noticed earlier that it displays the floor the car is on. I wait patiently as the number slowly drops. Finally, it stops on LD4. It takes me a few seconds to translate that to lower deck 4. I feel a sense of relief. Those decks are off limits to guests. That means it doesn't affect my plans to get through the night. I feel a presence further down the hallway. I stare at the elevator for a moment longer before turning towards it. I've learned over the years that it's worse to ignore them than to acknowledge them. Standing a dozen yards away from me is a young girl of maybe 10 or 11. Her brown hair is tied back in a ponytail. She's wearing pink pajamas. Like most of the other spirits I've encountered over the last five years, there's something off about her. It's like a small amount of color has been drained out of her. She stares up at me for a pair of heartbeats before she points at the elevator. The message she's sending me is clear. I shake my head firmly. I tell her that I'm sorry, but whatever is happening here isn't my business. More than that, it's obviously dangerous and it doesn't make sense for me to take unnecessary risks when I can be off the ship and on my way back to safety in the morning. Her hand slowly lowers back down to her side as she listens to me. By the time that I'm done talking, she's looking down at the floor. If this was some bad horror movie, she would do something scary, maybe lunge towards me with a terrifying look in her face. That isn't how things work. Spirits are the lingering souls of people, people with their own personalities and reactions to situations. This girl is reacting with sadness and disappointment. Somehow, this is far worse than if she had done the evil spirit lunging thing. She looks back up at me and reaches up to move her ponytail to one side. She then turns around so that I can see the back of her neck. Despite myself, I move closer to get a better look. There's a small round mark just below her hairline, the trickle of blood running out of it. I immediately think of the plastic bags in the red-haired woman's cart. Some things click into place. The liquid inside the air conditioner must be some sort of anesthetic. The fan turns on, the chemical gets sprayed into the air and knocks out whoever happens to be in the cabin, and the ship's staff comes to drain blood from the unconscious passengers. I squint as I look at the spirit. I'm guessing that any deaths from this process is unintentional, or there were specific reasons behind them. When I looked into the cruise ship, I had learned that it had been operating for years. Unexplained deaths and disappearances would have made that impossible. It's more likely the crew was only taking a small amount of blood at a time so that it wasn't noticeable to the passengers that were being harvested. Usually. Spirit Girl turns back towards me. Something had obviously gone very wrong in her case. She stares at me as she silently pleads with me. I sigh in defeat, knowing that I'm going to do something incredibly stupid. Innocent people are dying, and many others are being violated. I can't get off the ship in the morning without having some evidence to present to the authorities so that they can put a stop to this. The girl comes over to me and places her hand on mine with a smile. An electric charge goes through my fingers as she makes contact. I return the smile a bit unsteadily and nod once. Seemingly satisfied, she vanishes. I return my attention to the elevator. I'm not going to get very far unless I do things the smart way. 
using the elevator will bring too much attention, not just from the noise of it moving and arriving on a floor, but also from the arrows and floor indicator above the door. I'm going to need to take the stairs. They're located a bit further down the hall. As I move quickly but carefully across the carpeted floor, I notice just how quiet these sleeping quarters are. It's not that late in the evening. There should be some noise. Some sign of people moving around inside their cabins or going from place to place. Instead, there's nothing. I wonder how many people are passed down their cabins as a result of being unwittingly gassed by the air conditioners. It's a warm night, even with the breeze coming in over the waves. I wouldn't be surprised if most people had sought the comfort of their room's air conditioners at this point. The stairwell isn't very wide, and it's only lit by a single white bulb at each of the landings. I place my hand on the railing and slowly make my way down. It's more difficult than I would have thought. The movement of the ship is far more noticeable here, and my stomach starts to churn as everything sways back and forth. I grip my teeth and unsuccessfully try to ignore the nausea. Each time I reach a landing, I look over the edge of the railing and peer down to make sure that I'm still alone in the stairwell. Doing so only serves to strengthen the swirling sensation in my stomach, but it's worth it to ensure that I'm not walking head first into something that I can't handle. The stairwell remains clear until I reach the door marked Lower Deck 4. There's a keycard reader next to the door. I should have expected there to be security measures on the lower decks where passengers weren't supposed to be. I can't get inside. The light bulb overhead flickers for a brief moment, and the red light on the card reader goes dark. Furrowing my brow, I reach out and pull on the handle. The door swings open easily. I open it about halfway before looking inside. The hallway beyond is dim, but I'm still able to see the girl's spirit just before it disappears. It appears that I'm not as alone as I thought. The hallway goes past several pieces of large machinery that I don't recognize. All of them make a nearly deafening level of noise as they work, sending all manners of shrieks, hums, and squeals echoing off the metal walls. The good news is that there's no way anyone will hear me coming. The bad news is that it's impossible for me to hear anything as well. At the end of the hallway is another door. I open it slowly and pass through into a much quieter corridor. It's also decorated like the rest of the ship rather than being bare metal like the hall I had just come through. Each side is lined with wooden doors, and at the end is a double set with circular windows at the top center of each. I press my ear up against the first door on the left and listen. It's difficult to hear anything through the thick wood, but I'm pretty sure there's no one in the room beyond it. I turn the knob and open it just enough to peek inside. Verifying that I am indeed alone, I quickly go into the room and close the door behind me. It takes me a moment to comprehend what I'm seeing. I'm looking at a room containing dozens of tall dialysis machines. A long series of the plastic bags I had seen the red-haired woman with are hooked into one end of each machine, and at the other is a heavy case. Each machine is marked with a different blood type. From what I can tell, it seems like the blood from the ship passengers is being processed and cleaned, then put into a long-term storage container. What the fuck is going on here? I stumbled onto some sort of black market blood operation? I take my cell phone out of my pocket. Since the ship doesn't have any Wi-Fi and there's no signal this far out to sea, I'd assume that I wouldn't have any need of it while I was on vacation. Now here I am, using to take pictures of one of the strangest and most disgusting things I've ever seen. I check the other rooms on the sides of the hallway. All of them on the left are filled with dialysis machines, while the rooms on the right are stacked to the ceiling with the storage containers. Putting aside the absolute wrongness of it all, this is quite the sophisticated and organized operation. Finally, all that I have left are the double doors at the end of the hallway. I crouch down as I approach them, making sure to stay low enough that I can't be seen through the circular windows. When I reach them, I stand up again, but I do so in such a way that my body is off to one side of the left door. I take a few deep breaths to gather my courage before leaning forward to peer through the window. I quickly pull back away from it. Inside the room are half a dozen people sitting at a table. Being careful to expose as little of my head as possible, I lean forward again, this time only enough to see through the window with one eye. I'm looking at a dining room. 
Seven people are seated at it, chatting amongst themselves in a casual manner. At the head of the table is a man that I recognize as the ship's captain. The only other person that I'm familiar with is the red-haired woman. She is sitting slightly apart from the others and isn't speaking with them. As I watch, she reaches out with one hand to pick up the crystal glass in front of her. It's filled halfway with a thick red liquid. She holds it up to her lips for a moment before taking a sip of the blood. Nodding in satisfaction, she places the glass back onto the table. I was already feeling afraid, but now I'm starting to feel panic creeping in. I pull back from the window and force myself to calm down. Losing control now will all but guarantee that I'll be caught and made to disappear. Once again taking out my cell phone, I carefully take a few pictures through the window. I'm not sure how well they'll come out, but there's no way that I'm going to take the time to make sure that they're perfect. I need to get out of here before anyone realizes that I've been here. While I don't run back down the hallway, I move fast enough that it might as well be. I go back through the machinery room and into the stairwell. Taking the steps two at a time, I hurry back up the floors. After just a brief moment of thought, I continue past the deck that my cabin is located on. I need to get to somewhere more public. That's where I'll be the safest until the ship docks. I reach the level of the outdoor pool and practically throw myself through the door. This deck is almost completely outdoors, and the salty smell of the ocean fills my nostrils. There's plenty of activity here, with the pool still filled with swimmers and the nearby bar bustling with customers. On the far side of the deck is a stage with a band playing on it, and a large group of people are dancing to the music nearby. I sigh in relief. Even though it was absurd, a part of me had been convinced that I was going to find myself alone up here. For the next hour or so I hang around the bar area, making sure that I'm close enough to other people to blend in. I strike up a brief conversation with the bartender and I'm happy to hear the first son of every voyage always has people that party the entire night. I won't seem out of place at all when I don't return to my cabin. I'm beginning to get a bit of a headache. With the adrenaline wearing off, my body is protesting what I put it through. I wander around the deck and past the pool as I seek a somewhat private but still public enough spot to let myself rest a bit. Finding such a spot near the front of the ship, I lean up against the white railing and breathe the night air in and out. The headache eventually relents, and by the time that I turn away from the water it's no longer bothering me. I freeze, one hand still on the railing. Standing near the bar, her hands in the pockets of her black pants, is the red-haired woman. She's staring at me with her face expressionless, her hair blowing to one side in the wind. She knows. I have no idea how, but she knows. There's an odd blur, and the woman is no longer standing by the bar. Instead, she's now just a few feet away from me, her hands still in her pockets. She's moved so fast that my eyes couldn't follow her, and no one else on the deck seems to have even noticed it. She doesn't say anything. This part of the deck is fairly dark, and she's shrouded in shadows. We look at each other in silence. There's a single pinprick of pale light in each of her eyes. They're like lonely stars in a completely black night sky. The sight of them makes me shiver despite the warm evening. I have no doubt that the woman standing in front of me isn't human. The drinking of blood, the inhuman speed, the lifeless eyes. Only one word comes to mind, an impossible one that until now I thought only belonged in scary stories and countless movies. Vampire. There's no doubt in my mind. This woman could kill me on a whim. I won't be able to stop her. Hell, I won't even know she's doing it. It will be over before I'm even aware that things have started. The pinpricks of light shift slightly as she looks off to my left. I don't have to turn around to note the spirit of the young girl is now next to me. I probably shouldn't be, but I'm surprised the vampire can see her. I've only met a couple of other people that can see the dead. It's just incredibly rare. I wonder if the gift is specific to this individual woman, or if it's a trait that all vampires share. For a long while, the three of us just stand there. Despite the situation, I start to feel that I'm the third wheel in our little group. There's something going on between the spirit and the vampire that I don't understand. Suddenly, I'm airborne. It all happens so fast that I can't mentally process exactly what's happening to me, 
but I clearly feel my feet leave the floor and a burst of wind flow over my body. I land hard on the deck below, the wind whooshing out of my lungs. The fall hurts. It should have been much worse, though. Between the height and the speed that I was thrown at, I should be dead. I force myself up onto my elbows as I attempt to suck air back in my lungs. It's much darker on this deck, and very few lights are on. It doesn't look like this deck is used after dark. Surrounding me are a number of spirits. Men, women, and children are all represented, and judging by their modern clothes, they've all died within the past 20 years or so. They're all looking down at me, some with solemn expressions and others with smiles on their faces. I have them to thank for my surviving my unexpected fall. I look back up at the pool deck. While I can't actually see them, I know those strange eyes of the red-haired woman are looking down at me. The presence of the young girl's spirit had stopped her for a brief moment. I can only hope that the presence of so many others now will at least make her more cautious. It's the only thing even resembling an advantage that I have. I make it back to my feet and, not knowing what else to do, hurry over to one of the doors leading back into the ship. The only thing that I could think of is to find a place to hide until the ship docks. That's assuming the ship does dock when it's scheduled to, of course. There's always the possibility that the red-haired woman has the captain stay out at sea until I'm found. Hopefully they either won't think of that or they'll dismiss it due to the possibility of it raising suspicions among other passengers. Going inside, I find that I'm on the deck with the ship's gym and workout facilities. The only lights are the red exit signs above the various doorways. Outside of those small pools of illumination, the entire area is dark. I have to move much slower than I like to to avoid tripping over the various pieces of exercise equipment. I'd love to have more light to work with, but flipping one of the switches along the wall would be announcing my exact location to my pursuer. Or pursuers. That thought makes me come to a stop. The entire group that I had seen in the lower deck dining room could be on their way towards me at this very moment. Maybe even more. Who knows how many of these things are on this damn ship. My right foot bumps hard into a small dumbbell sticking out from underneath a weight bench. I barely manage to stop myself from swearing as pain blossoms from my toes. Nothing is broken, but it still hurts like hell. I'm about halfway through the room when the door on the far side opens. I duck behind an exercise bike just before a figure appears in the opening, the light from the hallway framing it. I peer out through the gaps in the machine. The person turns to one side slightly and the light hits them just right for me to see that it's one of the men that have been seated in the dining room. There's something different about this man. He doesn't move in the same fluid motions as the red-haired woman, and even from this distance I can tell there aren't those same white points of light in his eyes. He also doesn't seem to see any better in the dark than I do, as the first thing he does is start to turn on lights. I'm not concealed very well, and it doesn't look like there are any good places to hide. As soon as he has the lights on in my part of the room, I'll be fully exposed. I wait until he's moved towards the switches further down the wall before standing up. As I do so, I pick up a weight like the one I tripped over moments earlier. Before the man can turn around, I rush forward with the weight raised. He hears me approaching and begins to turn around, but before he can do so, I'm on top of him and swinging the weight. It connects with the side of his head and he immediately collapses to the floor. Whoever this man is, it's obvious that he's not a vampire. I pull my cell phone out of my pocket and quickly look through the pictures I took on Lower Deck 4. They aren't the best quality, but they're clear enough for me to see that only the red-haired woman has a glass filled with blood. The other people present are eating normal food and are drinking either water or alcohol. I can't be sure. That seems to imply that only the red-haired woman is a vampire. It's a very good thing if true. The problem is that I don't have any way to verify it. Besides, they probably want to kill me just as badly as the vampire does. I need to keep my head on a swivel. The man at my feet is barely moving, and those movements are just small twitches. Blood is running from the wound in his head where I struck him with the weight. I've never been a violent person. I've never even been in a fight. Not a real one, anyway. I'm almost sickened by how easy it was to assault this man, even if he was trying to kill me. I notice something lying next to him. Leaning down, I find that it's his cell phone. I pick it up and look at the screen. 
It's a map of the deck that I'm on, zoomed in to show the room that I'm currently in. There's a small dot with my name right where I'm standing. I swear violently, I'm being tracked. It's not even hard to figure out how. I reach into my pocket and take out the key card to my cabin. I toss it across the room and watch as the dot on the cell phone screen moves along with it. Damn it. It's very likely that I'm about to have a lot of unwanted company. I feel the air stir just before the lights the man had turned on click off one by one. It's happening faster than I can react, faster than I can even begin to form thoughts about what's going on. Before I can even turn towards the first of the extinguished lights, she's standing in the now dark room directly in front of me. It's too dim to make out details, but the already familiar silhouette of the red-haired woman now stands between me and the doorway. She briefly glances over her shoulder at the man lying unconscious on the floor. If she's angry about me having knocked him out, she isn't showing it. She returns her attention to me and simply stares at me for what feels like hours, but is probably only minutes. I have the distinct impression that she's looking for something in particular. Whatever it is that she's looking for, she apparently doesn't find it. She takes a slow, deliberate step forward. I've seen how fast she can move. The only reason for her to be approaching like this is because she's taunting me. She's enjoying this little game. I want to be defiant and show that I'm not scared, but of course I'm afraid of her. I take a step backwards. The red-haired woman raises her right hand. She's holding a cell phone. No, I correct myself as she slowly turns it with her fingers. She's holding my cell phone. I hadn't even seen her move. As I watch, she clenches her hand closed and the phone shatters into a useless pile of plastic, metal, and glass. She opens her hand and allows the remains to fall to the floor. The message is clear. No evidence. No lifeline. Nothing but broken pieces. I desperately look around for something, anything that might help me to escape. I can see the spirits watching me from outside the windows. Either they can't interfere, or they're choosing not to. I'm on my own. Or maybe not. The spirit of the young girl appears behind the vampire. The red-haired woman must sense her presence, because she turns around to look at the apparition. They stare at each other silently as the seconds tick by. Once again, I feel like I'm almost an afterthought for both of them. This might be my only shot. Hoping that their strange staring contest continues, I make a run for the open door. The thought of being trapped in the narrow hallways with the vampire isn't a pleasant one, but it's better than sticking around until she decides to murder me. I'm amazed when I'm allowed to make it to the door, and even more amazed when I'm able to close it behind me and make a mad dash down the corridor. I pick random side hallways to continue down. It doesn't matter which ones that I choose. I don't know what's down any of them, and all I care about is putting as much distance between me and the vampire as I possibly can. I reach a set of stairs leading down and descend them as quickly as I can without risking a fall. Spraining an ankle now would be a death sentence. The stairs go down much further than I expected them to. There aren't any doors or landings as they spiral down into the ship. When I finally reach the bottom, a sign informs me that I'm on lower deck two. With the way the floor numbers work on the Atlantean Tribute, that means that I'm only one floor up from the very bottom. This isn't where I want to be, but at the same time, going back up the stairs and just hoping that the red-haired woman isn't waiting for me isn't a very appealing option either. I pass through the metal doorway and walk slowly down the hallway. Now that I'm no longer being tracked digitally, my best course of action is probably to hide and wait until morning. The schedule I had seen when I first arrived on the ship had said that it would dock at the island early, sometime around 5 a.m. I check my watch. That's still a few hours away. I go to the first door on my left and open it. Making sure that both the room beyond and the hallway are empty, I slip inside and close it again, making sure to turn the small lock closed. It won't do much against the red-haired woman, but maybe it will deter other people from trying to come in. I'm standing in a small office. A wooden desk and a leather chair are placed up against one wall, and a series of filing cabinets stand next to them. A number of files, most of them closed, are stacked on top of the desk. I ignore them as I search for another way out of the room. There's a small vent up near the ceiling, but it's not large enough for a person to climb through. The only way in or out is through the main door. All there is to do is wait. 
I sit down at the desk and sigh as I rub at my temples. The beginnings of what is sure to be a major migraine are starting to set in. I glance down at an open file on the desk. The top page appears to be some sort of sales sheet. I pick it up and take a closer look. It's definitely a sales sheet, but it's not the type that I'd expect to find on a cruise ship. Instead, it looks almost like an invoice for food products with the Atlantean tribute the seller. The items that were sold were measured in milliliters and... I feel a cold chill go down my spine. Almost forgetting the danger that I'm in, I carefully read through the paperwork in the file, then open another one and pour over its documents as well. It isn't long before I've made my way through the entire stack. I sit back in the chair and run a hand over my face. The information has painted a picture for me, and it's not a pleasant one. From what I can tell, the blood being harvested on the ship is being sold to individuals on the islands that the cruise ship docks at during its regular route. When I had first realized the vampires were somehow impossibly real, I had assumed the blood being collected and purified was for the consumption of the staff. The truth is much bigger than that, though. The Atlantean Tribute is a mobile supplier of blood to nearby and, judging by the prices on the invoices, wealthy vampires. I look up at the ceiling. This is one hell of a supply and demand situation. A grotesque twist on capitalism. There's well over a million dollars of income detailed in these documents. Even more impressive, they're all dated within the past three months. The annual numbers that this enterprise combined with the amount earned from bookings from passengers has to be substantial. This changes things. I don't know how exactly, but it does. It means the people are being assaulted, their blood fucking drained from their bodies, not just to satisfy some sort of hunger. It's also being done for monetary profit. That's cold and calculated, and it's also somehow much worse. The reporter in me is screaming to collect this evidence so that I can use it to bring this whole thing down. The realist in me is responding firmly that I no longer have a phone to take pictures with, and I certainly can't run around the ship carrying a large stack of files. All that I can do is get off the ship and hope that I can somehow convince the authorities that I'm not completely insane. I hear a noise coming from the hallway. I remain as still as possible, listening intently as the noise comes closer. The red-haired woman has found me, and I'm completely trapped. I nearly laugh in relief as I realize that I'm hearing two distinctly male voices talking. Clamping a hand over my mouth, I get out of the chair and slowly make my way to the door. I place my ear up against it. I can't make out everything that they're saying. The door isn't very thick, but the metal hallway is distorting their words. They walk right past the door towards the stairs I descended a bit earlier. They don't seem to be searching for me. As they move past my hiding spot, I clearly hear one of them say that the ship will be docking at its first stop in less than 15 minutes. Surprised, I check my watch. It's nowhere near 5 a.m. I glance back over the files and things click into place. Of course the ship is docking in the early morning hours before the posted time. That way the crew can unload the blood and deliver it to the purchaser without the passengers being aware. Even if some of them notice the crew's activity, they won't have any idea what they're actually seeing. My best chance to get off the Atlantean tribute is going to be while that unloading process is happening. The crew that's involved with it will be distracted, and I'll still have the cover of darkness. I'm going to have to figure out how to actually sneak off the ship, which won't be easy if the boarding ramp is guarded, but it's still better than trying to escape in broad daylight. I wait for a couple of minutes before carefully unlocking and opening the door. There doesn't seem to be any members of the crew nearby, and the only sounds I can hear are the noise of the ship's engines and my own footsteps echoing off the walls. This deck isn't adorned in the fancy trappings of the upper decks. The bare metal makes it seem much more claustrophobic. I can't go up the stairs that I originally come down. The crew members that I'd heard from inside the office went that way, and they also lead to the deck that I last saw the red-haired woman on. I continue down the hallway, stopping every so often to listen closely. I don't bother to check any of the other rooms. My only goal at this point is to get the hell off. The hallway doesn't end when I reach the far side. Instead, it curves off to the right. I continue to follow it. There are no doors in this section. 
Instead, there are a few places where large metal gates extend down from the ceiling. Through the mesh, I can see pieces of equipment that I don't recognize secured behind them. I go around another curve and stop. Standing a few yards ahead of me is the spirit of the young girl. She looks different from when I last saw her. I've seen ghosts or specters or whatever you want to call them for a while now. Every time I see one, it looks different from a living person. It's a little hard to describe, but it's like some of the color has been drained from it, and it seems somehow less substantial. It's sort of like looking at a picture of a person that's been printed on a translucent piece of plastic. I've never seen a spirit look as colorless and see-through as the girl is now. She looks... I know this sounds weird when talking about a ghost, but she looks tired. I wonder if the encounters she's been having with the red-haired woman are somehow taking a toll on her. I've never heard of that happening before. I hadn't known the vampires were real until tonight, though, so obviously there's a lot that I don't know. This section of the hallway has more doors, and she points at the one closest to her. She wants me to open it. I chafe at the delay, but the girl's been protecting me all night, and it doesn't make sense to start ignoring her now. I walk over to the door and do as she asks. The room inside is dark, and I spend a moment looking for the light switch. When I flip it on, I find that I'm looking at a maintenance room. Raising an eyebrow, I look back at the girl. She points once again. I return my attention to the room and finally see what she's trying to point out to me. In the far wall, partially obscured by some boxes leaning against it, is a ladder. I go into the room and close the door behind me. Upon inspection, I find the ladder is actually a series of metal rungs bolted into the wall. It goes up into the ceiling and disappears out of sight as it extends beyond the light from the room's single bulb. Making sure to grip each rung tightly, I begin to climb. The rungs themselves aren't very large and the climbing isn't easy. I still count myself lucky. Ascending up to the ship this way means that I'm extremely unlikely to bump into anyone from the crew. That's a very real risk, maybe an inevitability, if I just continue to wander through the halls. I swear as I bump my head on something solid. I feel around in the darkness, and my fingers run across a smooth metal surface. I've hit a hatch. I manage to find the release button and lift it up before continuing through the darkness. I climb more cautiously now, reaching up after every few rungs to feel for hatches so that I don't slam into another one. It feels like I've been climbing forever when I run out of rungs. Reaching down, I close the last hatch that I came through so that I have something to stand on before stepping off the ladder. I grope around until I find the light switch and flip it on. I'm in a maintenance room that looks almost exactly like the one that I had started in. I lean against one of the walls and give myself time to catch my breath. My hands and feet are hurting from the climb. There's nothing I can do about that, though, so I try my best to ignore them. I'm not really sure where I am on the ship. I definitely climbed through a number of decks, but I don't know if the hatches I passed through mark changes in decks or if they were at different intervals. When I leave the maintenance room, I find that I'm once again in one of the corridors decorated in the ship's trademark Victorian style. This doesn't seem to be one of the passenger cabin levels. This suspicion is confirmed when I pass a closed set of doors with a sign outside, marking it as the Poseidon's Bounty, one of the restaurants. That means that I'm on the deck with the entryway that I first arrived in when I boarded the ship. I smile to myself. This is exactly where I need to be. That smile quickly fades when I realize that's not correct. The Atlantean Tribute likely uses other levels for loading and unloading cargo and supplies. It's no time to start panicking. On the plus side, I'm at least far from the last place the red-haired woman had seen me. I'm also on a deck with a large amount of windows. I might be able to use those to figure out which deck is being used to unload the blood. I come around the corner into the section of hall leading into the entryway and have to immediately duck into a doorway. Standing just in front of the desk is the red-haired woman. Luckily, she isn't looking in my direction. I only got a quick glance at her, but it looked like she was staring down at a tablet. Taking a deep breath, I peek out around the corner of the doorway. She's no longer there. I step out from behind cover and cautiously start to move forward. I've only gone three steps when I feel the air shift on the back of my neck. 
I freeze in my tracks. All the lights in the hallway snap off, plunging the corridor into darkness. She's behind me. I'm not sure how, but I know that no one is coming to save me this time. There was something about how the girl's spirit had looked the last time that I had seen her. It was frail, if that's even possible when it comes to the dead. Even if she were to put in an appearance, she wouldn't be able to defend me this time the way that she had twice already. I don't turn around. Instead, I sigh dejectedly and lean up against the doorway. The exertion of running around the Atlantean tribute like a chicken with its head cut off is caught up to me. I feel defeated. It's not like I could defend myself against this woman even if I was at my best, and I'm certainly not at my best right now. At least I've made the chase somewhat competitive, even given the giant chasm between her abilities and my natural ones. Do you know that I'm a reporter? I ask quietly. There's no response. I continue on anyway. I used to work for a major paper in Chicago. I'm not arrogant enough to think that I was famous among the readers. Nobody reads a paper and looks for specific writers' names. They read it for the entire presentation. Still, I was pretty successful, and I like to think that I had the respect of my peers. I thought that I'd be working at that paper forever. The red-haired woman still doesn't say anything, but it feels like I have her interest. She's at least allowing me to tell my story. That changed about half a decade ago. I was looking into a string of child disappearances. At least the police thought they were disappearances. They were street kids, and sometimes it's hard to know if someone is taken against their will or just have walked away to find another corner. Their friends were worried, though, worried enough to call the police when one of the first rules you learn on the streets is not to call the police. I shake my head slowly. I did things the way I had been taught. I talked to the right people, I asked the right questions, and what do you know it, I got a lead. One of the kid's friends pointed me towards an old warehouse. It hadn't been used in, well, I don't know how long, but it was a long time. With the way it was jammed between other buildings, I doubt anyone even remembered it was there. That happens, you know. Cities like Chicago, they just keep building outward and upward until places and people are forgotten. I finally turn around, doing so slowly to make sure the vampire knows that I'm not attempting anything foolish. I immediately spot the white pinpricks of light in the darkness. I swallow hard before continuing. So I went into this warehouse. That's not how I was taught, by the way. As a reporter, you're taught to be relentless, but also safe. I threw that lesson out the window by going in alone. I didn't even inform the cops about my tip. For all I knew, I was walking right into a serial killer's lair. Anyway, I went inside. I don't know what I was expecting, but it wasn't what I found. There was a big tent sitting in the middle of it. Red and white stripes, the kind that make you think of a circus. There were all these balloons floating through the air. A lot of them had gotten stuck up on the ceiling, and there were some popped ones lying on the ground. There was other stuff on the ground too. Plastic wrappers, peanut shells, all kinds of crap. The white lights have shrunk a bit, like the red-haired woman is squinting at me. In front of the tent, there was this absolute giant of a man. He was dressed like a clown. Makeup, clothing, the whole nine yards. He was sitting on a bench that looked like it could barely hold him. This clown, he was... He's... I have to take a deep breath to steady myself. He was holding the body of the kid I was looking for, cradling it almost, and he was, this fucking monster was, he was eating the boy, fucking eating him. I run a hand over my face. My mind just stopped thinking at that point. I turned to run. I had to get out of there. The only problem was that there was this woman standing between me and the door now. She was wearing a black dress and a veil that covered her face. 
It was like I was looking at the creepiest bride I'd ever seen. She reached out towards me before I could stop myself. I guess the adrenaline was really pumping at that point, though, because I managed to jerk to one side and not get grabbed by her. The tips of her fingers brushed up against my neck for just a split second before I was past her and out the door. I thought she or the large man would come after me, but for some reason, they didn't. I look up at the ceiling. The cops didn't find anything when they arrived. Just an empty, rundown warehouse. The kidnapping stopped, though. I don't know if it's because I found where the kidnappers were, or if they simply moved on. All I know is that I needed to get the hell out of Chicago myself. Screw my career and future plans. I couldn't be in the same city that I witnessed that child being... I trail off. I'm silent for a long moment before speaking again. I notice that my voice is unintentionally quieter. I left three days later. Packed all my things, got in my car, and moved to a small town in Wyoming to run their local newspaper. Something came along with me, though. That woman's brief touch, it did something to me. I was able to see ghosts and spirits. Not all the time and not everywhere, but often enough that it stopped freaking me out and became, I don't know, commonplace. It's amazing what we can get used to, isn't it? I return my gaze to stare into the pinpricks of light. I've never told anyone this. Not all of it, anyway. I think I'm telling you now because I know that you're going to kill me. Because, in a way, you're doing me a favor. I still dream about that warehouse and the tent inside of it. When I close my eyes, I can still see that poor child... And when I'm alone, I can still feel that veiled woman's touch on my neck. I'm not saying I want to die, I I don't. I'm saying that in some ways, though, this is almost a mercy. I feel strong hands grip me around my waist. Without warning, I'm swept off my feet. Everything is happening so fast that I barely register what's going on. I'm flying through the bowels of the ship at speeds I wouldn't have thought possible, the force of my passage flattening my skin against my bones and stripping the moisture from my eyes. The vampire has me, and I'm powerless to stop her. Everything comes to a halt with a hard jerk. I gasp as my body violently shakes. It isn't until I begin to regain control of myself that I realize I'm strapped down to a table. The red-haired woman is standing over me. Lights are on here, and despite the situation, when she smiles down at me, I'm once again struck by her beauty. The cruelty in her eyes is anything but beautiful, however. I pull against my restraints, but I'm unable to make them budge. She watches me struggle for a few seconds before holding up two needles. Each is attached to plastic tubing. I look to my left and see that one of the tubes leads to a dialysis machine. When I look to the right... I find that the other tube connects into a series of saline bags. She sets the needles down carefully and points at a third tube sitting on a nearby counter. I recognize it as a feeding tube, the kind that hospitals use to feed patients that can't do so themselves. She's going to hook me up to these machines, and she's going to bleed me before allowing me to replenish my blood supply. Then she's going to bleed me again. She's going to trap me in a never-ending cycle, and there's not a damn thing I can do about it. I open my mouth to scream. I was wrong. This isn't a mercy. This is my own personal hell. The red-haired woman's smile broadens.